Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. Fishing isn't only about catching big fish. Targets can often be weighed down in the size ratings, but for different reasons can still send the old adrenaline pump into hyperdrive. One such a fish for me, and a great many other hardened veterans, is the place. What makes the place so special within flatfish circles is its obliging nature, potential for size compared to the other more regularly caught fish like flounders and dabs, and its willingness to make a fight if it rides to the boat, so far as the strength of the tackle allows, with repeated headstrong power dives, which means that it's pretty much always going to come in coloured side up, making it even more special as you get that first glimpse of those big red spots spread right across its coloured top side. Being commercially important also, it goes without saying that whenever people willing to cash in on the fish they catch get wind of its whereabouts, it's going to get hammered. So don't expect any location handouts here, like a signature on a death warrant. If or when you do find a hot spot, best to say nothing at all to anyone. Keep it to yourself and get the best out of it, particularly early season which is usually around March, though it can in favoured areas on the back of a mild winter even be earlier than that. It's what you do when you actually find the place that's the subject of this particular podcast. And joining us today to provide some insight into how to approach the situation in terms of bait, tackle and tactics is dinghy angler Wayne Conban, who fishes the East and White area. So what's the current situation in terms of place numbers in your neck of the woods? Because up along my native Lancashire coast, certainly for the past five years and possibly more, place appear to have been on the increase possibly in part due to a very rapid decline in inshore commercial activity, which again reinforces the point of saying nothing about their whereabouts until after you know that they've gone. Well, historically, the Solent has had um, a couple of spots which were known for, to be place spots. The Blocks is, is an example, quite a f- famous area for place fishing. And it's not deep water, it sort of uh, probably ranges from 12 to 20 feet. It's not a big area either, and it's, it's muscles, certainly... It's a muscle bed. And if you look at the, uh, the catch reports at the um, East Knee Cruising Association with Rocket Mob, we've got a fishing log, if you like. Even as uh, short a while ago as the sort of mid-80s, dinghy anglers were going out and getting catches of over 100 place at, at a time. Decent table fish as well, good size fish. And all round the sort of area just outside of uh, Langston Harbour, which you've got the winner and areas like that, were thick with place. Not so now. Absolutely not so now. The blocks has been a, a shadow of itself for the last sort of four or five years at least. And even prior to that, a good day was ten fish. And anything sort of two pound and above was good. Still the odd very good place gets caught, which is bound to, because the place does get hit very hard by dinghy anglers. I think I counted 90 boats there one day, which uh, on a small area, was they take quite a hit. I think it's one of the few species that does get hammered from rod and line anglers. So what we've had to do is find new place areas, uh, new place grounds, which is difficult, really difficult, because locally to us, you've got Hailing Bay, which uh, again, there's a few areas there which will fish okay, but if you want the real numbers and the and the real biggies, then you tend to have to travel east to off of Bogner, Selsey Bogner, that sort of area, what they call the middle rounds. Now even there, the whole idea with place fishing is to find the place. And that's the whole key. If you can find where they are, then that's what you have to do. But that is easier said than done. And obviously if you do find a spot, and there are places in the last couple of seasons where Two anglers have had over a uh, hundred place apiece. And if I tell you the sizes, I've had my mouth watering. We've had seven pound plus fish taken. There's one fella at um, our yard called Dick Stubbs who is, I bow to him as being the place man. Last year he came back with four, five and six pound fish on a regular basis. So you need to find them and that is easier said than done because, uh, from Langston Harbour, where I keep my boat, it's a 17-mile trip. So if you discount the uh, drifting and what have you, then it's at least a sort of 35-mile round trip. 
So it's a, it's a fair bit of fuel you burn going up there. And if you don't find them, there's a long way to go for brass and bits and pieces, which tends to be all, all you sometimes you will catch. Obviously, finding fish in those areas likely to attract them are key here in reducing trial and error. So what is it then from either the paper chart or from what you're seeing on your electronics that might tempt you to give a mark a go? I know a lot of people that have found good marks have found them by drifting. So they've drifted over areas. You will lose a lot of gear snagging, but you'll also pick up, obviously if you pick up a place, you pop it straight onto the plotter. And then if you find a pattern, clearly you're looking at the chart and the bottom to look for certain areas. But it's the muscles that seem to be attracting the place of these areas. It's the muscle beds. I think places do like patches of sand as well. So if you find a place with muscles, but with sand patches in between, then that's where you're onto a good day's fishing. Because they... They like a lot of flatfish, they like to bury themselves in, uh, in certain substrate, I suppose, sand being a, a particularly good one. But yeah, it certainly seems to be muscle beds that attract the place. What is it then about muscle beds, do you think, that is so attractive to place? Place have relatively small mouths, while muscles generally are, by comparison, quite large, on top of which they've also got tough shells to crack. Could it be the seed mussels, and if it is, are these mixed in amongst the more mature shells? Or maybe even something else which mussels attract, which in turn attracts the place. Well, a lot of the place that we pick up are stuff for the mussels, small mussels. So they swallow them whole. You see it in them, they've got a good big bulge. And uh, if you take the fish to the table and clean them, you'll find them full of mussels. But they also feed on crab and, and whatever, which I think have at the same ground. So there's a reason they're there. There's a reason mussel beds attract them. So I think it's because there's a lot of other bits and pieces over the same ground as the mussels are. OK, so we've got a picture in our heads now regarding what should be down there under the boat. So can we now start to look at seasonality and specific timing? For example, up here in Lancashire, they usually arrive late May to early April and stay concentrated up for a couple of months before spreading out and becoming more difficult to pin down in good numbers. Not having too much or too little tide also seems to help. What then are the timing specifics that you'd be looking for? Where we fish, tides are important because if it's a big tide, you can't really fish. I mean, because the tides are different around the country, I would say where we are, we're looking at a mid-tide and low for fishing for the place. Now, two reasons for that. One is because you're fishing generally light fishing, so if you're at anchor, you don't want to be using a pound and a half of lead for fishing for the place, so you want as light a lead as you can possibly get away with to hit the bottom. Now, drifting, we find that, well I found anyway, that uh, once the drift speed gets up to sort of a 1.2, 1.3 knots, anything above that, then you're wasting your time, generally. So as soon as it drops down to, to below sort of 1.3 knots, then we go on the drift, because it does tend to pick up the better stamp of fish. And what about the season itself down here? The build-up, the peak, then the tapering off. The south coast here, of Langston, we find that the place tend to come in probably start of March. They're generally very thin, and they're not that great for eating at the time. They're a little bit watery. You can still eat them, they're still fine, but you pick up a four-pound fish in, in uh, March, that's going to be five-pound at least in September. So they certainly come in to feed up around about March time. Now what happens is people tend to fish March, April into May for the place and then it's not so much that the place aren't there, certainly um, the further east you go, it's that the bream tend to come in then and the other the other species that like a bit of warmer water such as the hounds and the like. So people go away from targeting the place and then they go back to them around about September time and there's a, an opinion that there's two runs of place. I kind of don't think that myself. I think they're there all the time from sort of March onwards. But people don't fish for them in that middle period. And the reason they go back around September time is because they know they're fattened up and you're likely to get a thicker, you're just a nicer fish. Certainly better eating fish and certainly just a nicer size fish. Apart from the drift fishing, everything you've said so far pretty much mirrors my own patch which again could give the appearance of two distinct place runs, which are in fact people rediscovering the same fish. They're very specific for areas place. In fact, we've had divers 
on certain areas. We spoke to some divers. And also, they're fishermen as well, some of these fellas. They're good authority, I do believe what they're telling me. They've said that a lot of the place, they've seen people, baits being dragged over the ground, and the place has got their heads down. And then all of a sudden, it's like, suddenly, it's like flicking the switch, and we'll get their heads up, start to feed. So, yeah, I mean, it, it could be sort of certain stages of the tide. Again, a lot of people I know will swear that the flood is the best time to fish, and then you might as well go home when it starts uh, ebbing. But again, I haven't found that myself. I've found that if you find the numbers, I fish for them on the drift until the tide builds too much. Then I anchor, and you still catch them over that period. And then when it slows down again, and you go back on the drift there, then, so... Is that an effect What is it? It's rain. I actually filmed a place video a few weeks ago aboard Andy Bradbury's Fleetwood Base Blue Mink. We split the filming over two sessions, one out in the bay on a beautiful spring day, and the other, two days later, tucked up inside the river for shelter in cold, wet and windy conditions. That was deliberate, by the way, to compare and contrast the feeding habits, because Andy maintains that place especially can be turned on and off by weather conditions. On the outside day, it was sunny and mirror flat, and right from the onset, Andy said we wouldn't catch place, and we didn't. It seems that while they like bright weather, they also like some surface movement too. Contrast that to the fishing inside the river, where you could hardly stand up in the boat due to the wind, yet the place fed steadily throughout the entire day. Perhaps it's also the same down here. What then are the ideal conditions for you, and why do you think that should be? With us, um, water clarity does have a, an impact on the place fishing, especially on the drift, because without a shadow of a doubt, I think place are soap feeders as well as scent feeders. And that's why people use spoons, beads, bling, and I suppose to endorse that fact, a couple of weeks ago we had some anglers using uh, what they called LRF, which is very small lures, and they had, um, they had a very good day and afternoon, in fact. They had 109 place between the three of them, but 20 of them were caught on lures. So that tells me all I need to know, that place are soap feeders as well as scent feeders. So, yeah, the catch rate does tend to be slightly better when we've had settled periods, and, and as opposed to sort of dark, cloudy water. What about the suggestion that bright sunshine brings the place on, but without any surface ripple, it does nothing? Any experiences on that score? Um, no, not really. If you're fishing, as I say, the, bl the blocks area, you're only fishing in 12 to 15 foot of water in general. And I've fished it on flat calm days, mirror calm days, after a settled period as well. And I've had reasonable catches, but I've also had decent catches when the water's been coloured as well. So I've not really found that to be the case where I fish. And of course, when, when we fish east, we're fishing in um, anything up to 50 foot of water for them. So uh, I'm not sure how much light would penetrate down to, to the seabed in 50 foot of water. I really don't know. What I do know is that if it's been settled, especially in the deeper water, you're more likely to have a better day as opposed to if it's if you've got a nice flat day in amongst a, a, a lot of rough weather. Well, the trips I'm talking about were fished in probably less than 20 feet of water, and of course 250 miles apart. I suppose a more concern from a conditions point of view is wind speed if you're drifting, and tide size whether anchor or on the drift, both of which determine tackle choice and how the end gear is going to present. Given the types of tides and water depths you regularly face, what would be your favourite outfit for the place? Well, place fishing, I mean, I'm quite lazy in a lot of ways. I do put my rods in holders a lot, but with place fishing, it's a little bit different. I tend to like to keep holding my rod to feel little knocks and nibbles. On the drift, you, you've got to anyway, because, um, you know, you can't be really sticking a rod holder, it gets snagged in rough ground. So you've got to feel those little knocks. And, and when you first start drift fishing, it's quite difficult to differentiate between a bite and a snag on the bottom. But you do, eventually you, you know what's a bite and what's not after a while. So um, what I like to use personally is um, short traces. Short traces work well where we fish, undoubtedly. They don't fish long traces. And when I say short, I do mean eight inches. I'm on about a very short trace. The other good thing about holding on to your rod, players do inhale baits. Now, I know people say they've got small mouths, but countless times we've had pound and a half place with two 
size two looks down it, maybe thirty beads, and then it's trying to make its way up the line and grab hold of a glow stick that we've put on the end or something like that. I mean, you'd be amazed what they can take down. So they may have small mouths, but funny enough, I've got a, a tropical fish tank and uh, I had a freshwater flounder in there for many years. It was only the size of a fifty pence piece, so it looked a little tiny thing, but it would only eat proper live things. So I used to have to go out in the garden every other day, pick up some little worms. And the interesting thing about it was that I dropped a, a worm down next to it and it would slowly make its way over to it, get it near to its head, and then in one hit, it would literally engulf a worm in its length of its own body. And all it would be sticking out would be the very tip of it. And that, I kind of thought to myself, it just made me interesting to think, is there a similarity to the way place feed? And I mean, a lot of places are deep hooked, which tells me that they really do suck a bait in. So, um... Yeah, I'm not too worried about having a, a bit a bit of worm, a bit of tail showing on the end, and it doesn't really bother me too much. And, and even hook sizes, I don't want a big bait, and I don't want a fairly big hook, bigger than a lot of people would look at and say, uh, that's too big a place, but... Going back to your pet flounder, Andy, the Fleetwood skipper I mentioned earlier, had quite a sizeable pet place in a big glass tank, which he also observed feeding... He tied pieces of worm to some fine mole and would lower it in right on the fish's nose. The place would arch its head up to look at and follow the bait down to the bottom, then simply ignore it. It wasn't until Andy lifted it in front of its nose that it would make a grab and start to eat it. A lot of the best place fishermen on that hop their baits. So even if they're drifting, they'll lift their bait up, down, up, they're hopping their baits and they, they certainly get more takes than even just dragging it along the bottom. So, um, yeah, uh, I mean, they are, they're a very predatory place. They really are, they'll, they'll go after things and, and hammer things. So, uh, yeah, a bit of movement is good, definitely. What about hand tackle choices? Obviously, conditions will play the part, but what are your preferences? You might also mention line choice and even colour. Light. Basically, the lighter the better. So if it's good quality gear, but light, let's face it, you're not going to get a place that's going to really, really sort of like be a struggle to lift off the bottom, as it were. So, so you can use light gear. I mean, I've got, um, I think I suppose 12 to 20 or, or sort of 15 pound cast rods. Small, I think they're probably uh, 400 size fixed balls or, or, or multipliers. So as long as it's decent tackle again, because I think place put a fair scrap up. You can't just use rubbish gear. Lighter the better, because if you're holding it for all day, you want it to be nice and light. But um, because of where we fish for place, I've used braid and mono. Braid gives you that little bit more uh, light detection and, and what have you. But there have been times when I've, I've spooled up with mono because that's all I had. 20 pound mono tends to be absolutely fine. I suppose the same with braid. 30 pound braid, no problem. What I do find is weight. People sometimes fish too light at weight. But I like to know that I'm bouncing along that bottom, so. I will use enough lead that I'm absolutely certain that I'm bouncing along the bottom. I want to feel myself in contact with it at all times, so I don't want to be too far de- behind the boat either at times. But no, I've got no preference between um, braid or mono for place fishing. With your choice of hand tackle, you have to do what conditions say you must do. But terminal tackle is a completely subjective thing. The choices are pretty much limitless and to a large extent down to what you like which isn't necessarily always what the fish might prefer. So let's kick this part of the discussion off with trace mono strength and colour. Well, sometimes my trace choice is dictated by what I've got available sometimes. I don't like to go less than £20 breaking strength with my mono, because £20 to me is a good size for my trace material. And as I mentioned, I'm like a short trace, certainly a few beads and a spoon that won't go amiss. The big colours, that's a strange one, because black and green tend to be what a lot of people use. I've heard it's kind of uh, the same colour as the mussels down there, but I, I, I'm not so sure about that. I I do like a fluorescent bead close to the hook. I do like that. Anything that gives that a little bit of sight, that has got to be a good thing, a bit of attraction. Same as my spoon. It's not so much the colour of beads sometimes, it's that dark light in between the beads. So if you've got a light, a dark and light... Some people say red beads work because of red spots on place. Again, I've not found a magic combination that works any better than others. But uh, it's that side thing. 
But in your opinion, then, bling does work. I've no doubt about it. No doubt about it whatsoever. Yeah. What are your thoughts on hook patterns and sizes? Also on fine wire hooks and crushing the barbs down, because you know players are very likely going to gulp the whole lot down. Yeah, there's no easy way around that, because often they do engulf a bait, and of course if you've got anything really less than £2, I wouldn't take for the table personally. But yeah, it can be a difficult one. I, I do use uh, fine wire hooks for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, when you're drifting you will snag, and you'll bend the fine wire hook out. And then when you get it back up, you can just reshape that. But I wouldn't advise you do that too many times on, on a hook because clearly you'll make a weak point. But um, you can certainly get away with, uh, you know, a few drifts of, of a couple of times of bending the hook out. And, and it just means you'll get your tackle back a lot of the time. As for unhooking them, it's a difficult one. I mean, that you've got those uh, little freshwater disgorges sometimes, which are quite handy for going down and, and popping the hook out. Some people even say go through the gill cover and, and hook them out. What I would say, if it looks like it's really deeply and well hooked, you, you'll do more damage sometimes trying to work that hook out. It might just pay you to cut the mono as close as you can to the fish and just release it quickly. If it's a fine wire hook, chances are it's going to rust out fairly quickly. Let's face it, we don't really know, do we, what happens to some of those places when they go back. Certainly people have caught place with hooks in them and they're still feeding fine which tends to suggest that they will, if it can corrode out and will go, it gives that fish more of a chance of surviving. You've only got to look what fish eat. Near enough everything's got a spine or a spike on it. They don't tend to be too worried about being hooked. I mean, when we've been static, I've chucked a bait out, like a spreader rig on with two hooks, and I've chucked another one out. I've had a, pl- a small place as well, a pound and a half place, take both baits on one, move across, so it's towing a weight with it and those two hooks, and then pick up one of my other ones. So... They're a little bit tougher than they look sometimes. Describe to us your personal favourite place fishing trace. For where I fish, short. Short trace, about 8 inch trace, which a lot of people think that's far too short, but I like a fluorescent bead near the hook. I'll often tie a, a little stop knot up about halfway up, and then I'll put a few beads on and a spinner in between the beads, just to act as that little attraction in, just in front, of the, uh, in front of the actual bait. It's sort of I suppose anything really from 1.0 down to size 2 hook. Generally fine wire. And I'm not trying to put big baits on because uh, our club record actually of a £7 plus place came on a live sand hill when he was bassing. So, although they have got, or supposed to have small mouths, I've seen them engulf big baits and obviously sometimes a bigger bait means a bigger place. Up in Lancashire, we only ever fish for players at anchor. Finding them hauled up in small discreet pockets and having plenty of heavy ground scattered about the place doesn't exactly encourage you to want to fish on the drift. Elsewhere, I have fished for them on the drift and it's noticeable just how different the terminal setups are. What then are your thoughts on the comparison between the two? Yeah, yeah, there's an awful lot of place fishing at anchor. We only get a small window of, of the drift because once that speed gets too fast, you're wasting your time. So yeah, we do a lot of place fishing on, on anchor. On anchor, I tend to use a spreader rig. I knock them up the south. Can't remember what the gauge of stainless wire I've got. It's, it's plenty of beads running along it. And there's obviously a trace on each end. Again, a short trace. Usually no more than sort of 8 to 10 inches. And they're very successful at the anchor where we fish. They, they work really, really well. There's, I don't know as much I haven't tried, really. I've, I've, we put glow sticks on and you just see if it attracts them. They certainly seem to like them. They try to engulf them. So, uh, in that respect, they, I think, again, it's that visual attractor. But if I'm drifting, it'll be a single, certainly a single hook. It, it tends to be a bit, little bit better. But I've had, I suppose, what you would call pulley rigs on, and that, they all work if the place is there. If you're over the place, they're kind of, in fact, you don't have to have a, anything on other than a worm and a strip of squid. Sometimes just a strip of squid without a ragworm on it will do the business if they're there in numbers but it's when they're not and you're trying to add to your catch rate that's when the bling comes into its own I think You mentioned there the pulley rig which I assume is the same thing as the wishbone rig which really seems to have caught on in recent times I personally never used this rig 
I can usually get as many places as I want on other methods, including the spreader you also mentioned earlier. So what, if anything, do you think a wishbone rig can bring that other rigs can't? Um, sometimes it's just the fact that you've got two baits there instead of one. So if you've got like a, a spreader bait or a wishbone, you, you've got the two baits on. So you're upping your chances by just doubling your chances of the bait. I'm not sure it, that there's much else to it than that, really, from my own personal point of view, anyway. Because I mainly place fish at anchor, I tend not to use spoons, partly because of the weight and also the degree of tidal movement or drift speed required to rotate them. But where they can be used successfully, what is it do you think that spoons bring to the table? Well, I think a lot of people think of spoons as just being a, a visual attractant, but they must also create a bit of vibration as well, which I don't think can go amiss, certainly I don't think would hurt. But mostly it's that visual attractant of a spoon spinning and, and the, the fish spotting it coming over and then obviously taking your bait. I mean, I've had them down at anchor because I think it doesn't take a lot of tide flow to get those spoons spinning. But interestingly, we've recently been experimenting with very light plasticky spoons, um, got my picnic spoons really, just cutting the handle off, drilling a hole in them. And where they're so light, they move around a lot more. They really do whiz around, even in a little tiny bit of tide. And... Um, so far, they've certainly not put, um, well, not just place off. We've had hounds and rats and all sorts. So, that side of it, it's that attraction side of it, they can see it spinning there and it brings them over, all well and good. And I'm sure that vibration thing does something as well. For me, though, it's mainly sequins and beads. Sounds more like Strictly Come Dancing than fishing. And if I'm honest, I personally prefer the beads. In particular, the Gemini Genie beans in luminous green with small red spots. Whether they are actually better, or it's a confidence thing, really is a matter for debate. But ex-England international Alan Sharp, who also makes up traces for the squad, rates black beads which he fished in direct competition with the trace without any beads at all, and absolutely wiped the floor with it. I just can't help wondering what it could be about black beads that might attract the place. Do we really know what fish see how their eyes work I don't know that's for sure you can analyse why something works or you can just use it because it works and I think if it works it'd be nice to know why sometimes but if black beads work great I mean I'm, I've not tried a load of black beads but I will do that's one thing I haven't tried I certainly <laughs> next time I'm place fishing I should certainly have one made up with, uh, with black beads on it but um, no I don't want to keep banging on about the same thing but it for me, it's that visual side of it. Place a visual feeders. So, if it's something that catches their eye, that interests them, if it's that that brings them over to your bait, what I'm trying to do. Bling might do a good job at getting fish in the vicinity of your bait, but in the final analysis, what's on the hook has to be something they're happy to eat. So let's move on now to the best individual place baits, and also take a look at cocktail baits, which can appear on two separate fronts. Well, our neck of the woods, unquestionably, ragworm with a thin strip of squid to act as like a little flag, little attractor, uh, definitely. But I've before now I've had a little um, session out. I've had a bit of rag to use up. It's gone sort of in the morning, and I thought, okay, I'll just use squid strips on their own. They caught, they caught an anchor as well. They want a meal, don't they? So. Um, if it's something they fancy eating, then they'll take it. But certainly where we are, it's that rag and squid strip that does the damage. And I've tried blow lug. That certainly doesn't outfish the rag and squid. There's not a lot I haven't tried. I've tried um, fish strips, you know, sand eel, mussel, limpet. There's probably not a lot I haven't tried. And um, at the end of the day, I always go back to the rag and squid. Squid's important to power wear too. Probably, as you've said, acting like a tiny visual flag. But far and away the best bait for our place, certainly the bigger fish, is frozen black lug. And I have to be honest here and say that many of my better fish have been taken on twice frozen black lug from previous trips, taken as an emergency backup. That's very interesting with that bait side of it, because I know different areas fish different baits, because I know some of the lads down Devon way use huge peeler crab baits and whole sand eels and all sorts and 
as I mentioned, our, our club record places was called a live sand hill, so um, there's no doubt that they'll take what they can get a lot of the time. But I think a lot of it is trial and error. What suits your ground better? What is the best bait for your particular ground you fish over? And going back to the smelly, sticky bait, we fished once late in the year, just managed to feather up to really late season mackerel. So we took the sides off and dropped the fresh mackerel strips over, thinking this is going to be really good. Didn't get a touch on either for half an hour, so we brought it up, put the other side down. There was a boat no more than 200 yards away from us. We had a big shout, and he had a 10 pound two bass. And he had it on a piece of mackerel, it was so smelly and skanky, it was almost gone black. He said it had been frozen, defrosted about three times at least, and um, he had to whip it on. Now, didn't want to know our, uh, <laughs> our nice fresh bait, so. Sometimes there might be something in a bit of um, a bit of old smelly bait. You know, maybe it's not so much that it's they prefer it; it's just that they maybe they can find it easier. So, yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't knock that. You know, I've used old worm and caught well. I've... I ever noticed in fishing magazines, particularly when they're specifically shooting bait photographs, which are obviously set up, that they're always over exaggerated with either too much bait on the hook, and worse still, too much hanging clear of it. In a nutshell, contrive. Do you not find that having lots of bait, particularly worm hanging clear of the hook, is a recipe for small bait robbers to come along and destroy the whole presentation? I personally prefer to have my hook inside the bait, with perhaps a little flag of squid hanging free just to try to catch the fish's eye. Place in particular, I think it's so important, because I mean, I've used some really big old worms as well, and you get like... One twentieth of the worm on the hook, really, and the rest. Of it. Now that's a bit extreme. I don't want a few inches of towel wiggling around off the place because, as I say, I think they they just suck the whole bait in. So I'm not too fussed with that. If you're talking about other fishing, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I don't like a lot of bait away from the hook for that same reason. I think it just encourages stuff to grab the end of it and pull it off. But place, I'm not so fussed with place because I think they suck a bait in, and also. If I, can, if I can feed a worm on, round the bend, and basically bring the hook point out, and there's a few inches of nice wiggling tail still, great for place, I like that. And I'm not too fussed, and, and I don't really find too much problem with anything nipping it off and basically ruining the bait, so, so no, don't mind that for place. Another drawback with magazines at times, certainly as I see it, is the desire to show over complicated terminal rigs. By contrast, I like to keep things simple. As an example, the best place session I ever took part in, which unfortunately was back in the 1970s, saw four of us take 530 fish on tiny hook full of blow log fish from wire patanosas from an anchored boat with no bling showing whatsoever. And it could so easily have been many more, had we not simply run out of bed. Keep it as simple as possible, without a doubt. I've seen it actually, I've seen it many times when I've been fishing with friends who were very, very good Fishermen, very good. No two ways about it. And especially a lot of my shore fishermen friends that come out on the boat with me, some of their setups are mind boggling. And I've not seen an improvement in the fishing by using them, but what I have seen is more things to get tangled, it's more awkward when you, when you bring the fish to the side of the boat. Often what they do, they reel in and then they've basically got swivels, but then they've got about 20 feet of, I don't know, sorted bits and pieces coming off, and I just think it just makes for really, really awkward fishing sometimes. And if you can keep it simple, and it still works, I'm all for that. And as I say, most of my fishing really is, quite simply, um, running ledger. Depending on what is on the end of that running ledger, determines what I'm trying to catch. Clearly there are times when, when the running ledger, you, you've got to change over to another a technique, depending on what you're fishing for, but most of my fishing is done very, very simply. And the simpler the better, in my view. What is it then about place that appeals to you? I don't know really. I, I've always liked place. They're pretty fish. That's what I mean. That sounds a bit stupid, I know, but I, I like the look of place. I think they're lovely. I think they're handsome fish. They're game. They're very obliging when you find them. They're not hard to catch if you find them. That's the thing. If they're there, then they're very obliging. And of course, they, you know, they make for fair eating. I mean, I think they're better eating fish in the sea, but they do make for fair eating. So. Um, there is that as well. Any, anything that's a table fish, I think it's popular. Things that, are, that people like to eat, they like to catch, which is all well and good. But yeah, I don't really know. I, I like them. I think they're a game, little sporty fish. 
They never give you a monstrous fight. I don't really care what anyone says. That you know, compared to a bream, say you know that they're, they're not in the same league as a bream. You know, but they're game, and I like the look of them. I think they make a really nice picture. You take a photo of a nice place, and uh, I like them. I just think they're a nice, nice fish to catch. What I also like about players, particularly the first few early fish to shore, is that on the back of a long, hard winter, spring feels as though it's just around the corner. Absolutely. Basically, that lull that we have, well, I suppose you go around the country, but we certainly have that, um, that sort of January, February period, which tends to be the worst time. I mean, last year, actually, January wasn't a bad month, but um, usually February, probably February to March, I'd say, are the slowest two months. But you know that, yeah, the first of the um, decent species is the place. So, yeah, there is that part of it. And do you not also find that there's a bit of one-upmanship in that everybody else would like to be catching them as well? which, if you have and they haven't, is a particularly satisfying feeling. Why not? We're all competitive, I think, as fishermen. You know, we all like to tell tales of the size of the fish we've caught. Yeah, absolutely. I don't take many fish, actually. I really don't. I'll, I'll take what I'm going to eat. I'll take what I use for bait. Although I'm not knocking anyone for taking them. I'll take, if you catch fish and you want to take them to the table, absolutely fine. That's all well and good as far as I'm concerned. But from a personal point of view, I don't actually take that many fish of course, it's always nice to, to say uh, one was bigger than yours. So uh, if you catch a, a, a nice fish, yeah, great. But a lot of the time, I'm quite happy to photograph that fish nowadays and put it back. As long as I've got a record of it in that space, a bit of scale. Most of the fish, you've seen me with a fish, but you can see my elbows are bent. <laughs> I don't like these people that hold a fish as close as they can. You'll slime on the lens. It's like close to the camera. It's unreal. But uh, no, no, of course, there's one up for shit. If you've got a nice fish... Right, you say, you're proud of it, and um, yeah. Final question now, what does the future hold for the species? Well, there's a couple of points there. Because places tend to be localised on certain areas, and, and they can be heavy on one spot, they can get hammered. And they're, and they're one of the few species, I think, where rod and line anglers can do damage. And yet they do get hit very, very heavy, and a lot of people take everything they catch home with them as well, which, that's up to them. But they do get hit hard, the place. You're never going to find all the marks where they are. So as long as you know there's a good influx of fish coming in, uh, the population seems healthy. What I have noticed is that certain areas can get fished out. That has been my experience. The blocks is an example. At the moment, there's just very, very few fish there. And if you compare that to uh, historically how many have been, it's, um, it's not good. But the other thing we've definitely noticed is there are huge numbers of starfish on the mussel beds. And if you drift in, you'll bring them in. Big, grey, big orange, ugly things. They're horrible. The divers that we know have told us that they are moving over the mussel beds in a wave and leaving nothing behind. Just shells, empty shells. And what that has happened in the past, there's been mussel beds east, the Starfish have come in and decimated them, completely and utterly decimated them. And, um, and the place fish has, has disappeared afterwards. So, uh, you know, so some of this is not all um, man made, some of it. There are other factors. And uh, once they starfish, they're predatory, you know, very predatory. They, they feed on the mussels. And, um, but, you know, I'm sure the place will find something else to feed on. So uh, it doesn't seem to be bad numbers if you find them. If, as you've said, players can get particularly badly hammered by anglers. Is that not even more of a reason to keep your best marks to yourself? Yeah, there's... It's a very touchy subject with a lot of anglers. Sort of secretive and some people don't like it that you're not telling them where you're catching fish. You're always going to get that sort of attitude amongst fishermen. I've given lots of numbers and, and areas to people that I know. And they're, they're trying hard but not have good fishing and I can help them out. Of course I will. But, that said, there are certain... Areas and, and because of that reason of place being localised on one spot, yeah, I would tend to keep it quiet. I mean, there's a fellow I mentioned him earlier at our yard who finds place and he gets followed all the time. And he might have a couple of seasons on a mark. And when when you know this is a place that's producing four, five, and six pound fish, it's no wonder everyone wants to go where he's going. And they do find him, and as soon as it gets common knowledge you'll get 30 or 40 boats on there. You'll get half a dozen charter boats on there. Now, yeah, I, I can't blame people for not wanting to tell where these areas are. I wouldn't want to tell where these areas are for that very reason. 
As I said in my opening comments, don't expect to have any place marks handed out to you on a plate. On the other hand, from what Wayne has said, and the in-depth tactical information is also provided, it shouldn't be that difficult now to undertake a meaningful informed area search, and quickly establish whether or not you are in fact in the right spot. And if you are, as was also said, keep it to yourself. Fight the temptation to be seen with what you know others would love to be catching, including the commercial boats.